a great charger. And it's, it's well, again, well made. The good quality cables and good quality clamps and everything. And it's uh, pretty good. Who did I have? It? Oh, yeah. I, there was one that um, kind of inherited it when my wife's uh, sister's husband passed away here recently. There was a, uh, well, since my wife, and she inherited the contents of the house, uh, most of which we didn't bring home. But anyway, I did spot a... Um, a uh, battery charger that he had there, and I've got that also. And it was kind of clever. They, they say you don't have to worry about it uh, making any sparking when you hook it up uh, because they don't turn on the current until they sense the battery voltage of some amount. And then when they sense that, they turn it on so there's no sparking when you connect it. And I thought, that was kind of clever. And it also could work as a, uh, they said you could leave it on indefinitely as a battery maintainer. The only thing I didn't like about it was that you had, uh, uh, it was not a wall work type, you had a plug on it, and then the, the charger kind of had to hang out in the space there where I'm I, I did have it hooked up for a while, it kind of hung out in the space, and I had to uh, do that. But anyway, it, uh, I thought that feature about no sparking when you hook it up was pretty good. And I guess it would tolerate reverse polarity. It wouldn't turn anything on if it saw the polarity was reversed, which I think the uh, NOCO does that same thing also. So... Well, Larry, I see it's getting late here and about time to uh, QRT, so I'll turn it back to you so we can wrap things up and uh, call it good for tonight. But boy, your signal's been pretty good here all night. Uh, this has been great. Uh, nice armchair coffee. But, you know, too bad we couldn't do this center, but I, I guess it, it depended on so We couldn't do it until you put up the 40-meter dipole, so sure glad you did that. W7JYJ, this is W60QI. Okay, Mark, W60QI, W7JYJ. Yeah, you've uh, been a consistent uh, S9 uh, to uh, 5 to 10 over at, uh, at times on peaks locally. And I noticed on KPH uh, that you're even stronger. You're up in the 10 to 15 over 9 uh, range. Of course, uh, the estimators are probably not all that well calibrated. There could be a 5 or 10 dB difference between them. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I went on eBay to look for that uh, NOCO uh, Z3500, which is rated at 3.5 amp. I found a replacement, a 5 amp replacement for it on eBay that's at $69.95. So maybe uh, uh, the 5 amp uh, unit is on Amazon. Uh, maybe look around for it a little bit later. Transformer looks like, but it was quite fairly sizable. In fact, I remember we had a uh, 
section area outside the building where we had the transformers out there, and maybe the modulation transformer was out there also. I'm going to have to look at that book and see. It brought up a good question, Larry. But, uh, yeah, and I think the last one that I worked with was a General Electric 50 kilowatt transmitter that uh, seems to me that that was about 1960, as I recall, when we put that in at KPOL. They have since replaced it. I did some work over there with a different owner and everything, different call letters now, but I did do something over there a couple of years ago and they had a not to, no, a uh, uh, Harris BX50 was in there and the uh, GE transmitter was long gone, so they've gone to a digital-based uh, uh, transmitter for 50 kilowatts of AM. So, yeah, you're right. They, uh, in the early days, though, plate modulation was, I guess, the only way they knew how to do it. So they figured out more efficient methods. 77JYG, this is W60QI. Okay, W60QI, uh, 77J, uh, what yeah, interesting. Boy, you sure have a lot of fireworks when something goes wrong. <laughs> On a voice peak, over. Yeah, uh, yeah voice peaks, uh, the, the transmitters will generally handle that. It just, you know, it makes, uh, if you uh, get to the cutoff point, it makes distortion and some splattery stuff, but... Uh, uh, the transmitter generally makes it. Well, I remember one example. I think it was uh, when we had KFAC here. It used to be a classical music station. And they were doing a AM FM stereo thing where they had the AM carrying the left channel, I think it was, and their FM carrying the right channel. And a friend of mine and I got together and combined our receiving equipment to be able to listen to that in stereo. And I, oh yeah, it was the 1812 overture where they fire the cannons. And when the cannon went kaboom, on the AM side we got silence for several seconds when that transmitter kicked off and then uh, came back on. Uh, I guess the audio processing wasn't good enough to protect it from that cannon shot. But nowadays with the mo modern audio processing, if they're set up right, that's not a problem. W7JYJ for W60QI. Wow, that was interesting. And I had never heard uh, of uh, running uh, stereo with one channel on AM and the, uh, and the other channel on the uh, FM. Uh, that's news to me. Or? Yeah, there were several stations that did that from time to time. They didn't do that full time. It was, uh, I think, a special one evening deal that they did that. And that's why my friend and I kind of pooled our equipment to be able to, uh, to listen to it. And it was fun to do. So. I'm trying to think of it. Or, hmm. I remember something. Uh, I remember when I started working at KPOL. But we didn't do it with KPOL, but they needed somebody who was a member of the union because KCBH in those days was not a member of the union. No, they're not union employees. But they did a um, some kind of a stereo thing with. Uh, Another station, I forget what one it was now. So I went, I, I had, I went back to where I used to work to be the guy that would be the union fan and to run the thing and all that. Then I also remember we did two FM stations stereo here, not again, not on a regular basis, but there was uh, KHOF over in Glendale, and we got an equalized line over to their place and. Uh, I don't know, I think we carried the left channel and they carried the right channel, but that was kind of funny. Uh, uh, they were a religious station, and I guess at one point in the broadcast, they felt that our music was too jazzy to have on for their audience. <laughs> they, they, the next thing we know, they, our right channel goes away and their music starts playing, so we had to wait until they call them up and find out what was wrong and change our music to fit their needs to finish that broadcast that day or something. But yeah, we played around with all kinds of stuff there back in the days before real FM stereo got standardized, uh, W7JYG for W60QI. Wow, that's interesting, W60QI is W7JYJ. Yeah, very interesting. Well, my uh, favorite station back uh, in the early 60s, I guess, was KPEN. Yeah. 
like that phrase. That's interesting. And I don't remember the calls KPEN, so it must have been something up there in the San Francisco area that, that I wasn't familiar with. You keep something I was going to say, now I forgot what it was. Uh, uh, hmm, hmm, hmm. What was it you said there? That it keeps, I asked her to reply to something, now I forgot it. Um, oh, the, um, the uh, NA, let's see, I think it was the NAB was in Los Angeles, and I think the year was 1960, if I'm not mistaken, and an outfit called General Electronic Laboratories. Not General Electric Corporation, but General Electronic Laboratories had a tube type FM uh, stereo exciter, and uh, they made <coughs> made arrangements with it there at KCBH to um, uh, put that on the air. And I remember it was a big, tall rack full of tube type stuff that we hooked up, and uh, we were able to transmit uh, uh, FM stereo. The I guess it's still the same standard that we're running now. Uh, as an experimental basis. We didn't own that, ex that equipment to do it, so it was only on the air for a while. I remember we got that going, and I, the reason I remember is 1956, because that was the year I went to Europe, and I wasn't here for most of its use. By the time I got back, they had pulled it out, and, uh, uh, you know, the uh, owners of it uh, were experimenting with it, took it back. But anyway, that was an early uh, broadcast, but not full-time. So you're probably right about KPEN being the first ones to do it up there in the, state, in the West Coast. Uh, on a full-time basis. Well, I see it's getting late, so back to you so we can wrap it up. Our W7JYJ for W60QI. Yeah, uh, W60QI, uh, W7JYJ. Yeah, I just pulled up some of the history on uh, KPEN. KPEN uh, was started by James Gabbard, a uh, famous broadcaster in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area.
Hope it's good again next week. So 73 for now. W7JYJ, this is W60QI signing clear. Okay, Marv, uh, W60QI, uh, 77JYJ. So one final thing, uh, interestingly, uh, the KPEN uh, call sign is now uh, in Alaska. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a KPEN uh, AM and a KPEN uh, FM in Alaska. And uh, so Gabbard went through a number of changes on stations and call signs uh, in the Bay Area over the years.